committee will come to order. I would like to begin this uh, hearing by stating the Oversight Committee mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership, partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I would like to thank everybody for, uh, for your attendance here today for this hearing that uh, we have entitled, Taking Care of Our Veterans. What is the Department of Veterans Affairs doing to eliminate the claims backlog? I would like to thank the member participation. And normally I would give an opening statement, but in deference to our full committee chairman, uh, Chairman Issa, we are going to allow him to give his uh, opening statement at this time. I thank the chairman, and I apologize that there are two subcommittees going on. But this is the one that I particularly wanted to make sure I attended. Forty-two years ago this November, I raised my right hand and became a soldier. I have no claim today before the Veterans Administration. But for those 42 years, soldier, sailor, and Marines have served and need our support. It is unacceptable a Federal Government is doing nothing but continuing to promise what they promised before. 188 days is the average processing time for a claim. It is unacceptable. More unacceptable is the fact that the error rate is 16 percent and perhaps higher in some regions. Veterans who appeal the system face multiple years, 883 days, three years in order to be adjudicated. The system was broken during the Vietnam War when I enlisted. The system has never been fixed. So today we are going to concentrate in this committee on hearing what you are going to do, but understand we have heard it before. Today you will be judged by what you say and what you do. You will no longer be allowed to come back again with promises of reforms a year away. Today I understand that you will be talking about getting better over the next year, perhaps talking about ways in which you have improved recently. In 1970, the system was paper and the system failed veterans miserably. Today the system is computerized, but not harmonized. Today the, the Veterans Administration continues to claim that they will get better, but they have not. It is my goal on this committee to recognize that we will be going into a new Congress that next year will be under the chairman de determined next year. But if I am the chairman or if I can influence the chairman, you will be back. You will be back every single year until you get it right. Our veterans deserve better. My Camp Pendleton Marines today are, are Marines and, and corpsmen, but they are also veterans serving. And in the days and weeks to come, they will be going to Balboa Hospital. They will be going uh, to the La Jolla Veterans Facility. They will be making claims for the injuries they received in Afghanistan and Iraq and in training. They deserve that you get the system right because they cannot wait to be served a year later. They need your help now. And, Chairman, I want to personally thank you for allowing me to, uh, to go first. And I look forward to hearing the entire transcript of, this, transcript, transcript of this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you. I thank the Chairman and uh, appreciate his participation here today. Now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of our witnesses for being here today. Um, obviously, uh, several years ago, when uh, I was first chairing the subcommittee, we conducted the hearings at Walter Reed. And those hearings fortunately led to a substantial improvement in the physical plant at Walter Reed and another number of other facilities like Walter Reed across the country. It also led to sort of an ongoing effort for improvements to hold the Department accountable and to try to bring everything to the highest level of program service for our returning warriors and for our veterans. The coordination between the Department of Defense Disability Determination System and that of the Veterans Administration was a problem then. It continues to be a problem, obviously now, one that we have to work together. Uh, to try and improve. But I do appreciate Chairman Chaffetz's continued oversight of this whole process from beginning to end. And with this effort, uh, we are told that the employees at the Veterans Affairs are doing their part, uh, that they are processing more claims more quickly than ever before, 
And we have to recognize their efforts, which are responsible for a substantial decrease, increase rather, in the number of claims processed from some 440,000 to 2,000, in the year 2000, more than a million claims last year. But the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq have produced an even greater increase in the number of claims that are filed by veterans. And since 2008, the number of pending disability claims has grown 48 percent to 1.2 million claims, nearly half of those from a backlog of hundreds of thousands of claims. Secretary Chinsecki deserves some credit for his announcement that he has more than 40 initiatives to help VA process claims more quickly and more accurately in the future. An integral part of the transformation plan is the more than $500 million that were invested in a paperless veterans benefits management system, which is to replace the VA's legacy and outdated paper systems. We are interested in hearing more about that and its promise and how it is being implemented. If these initiatives are successful, the VA could cut in half the amount of time it takes to evaluate claims while achieving 98 percent accuracy. That is a goal that this committee ought to be uh, inclined uh, to continue its oversight in order to help the VA achieve that, uh, that mission. I hope the Secretary is successful. With more than a million troops projected to leave service over the next five years, the VA certainly cannot afford to fail and is going to be severely challenged. As claims are reopened, the existing files, I understand, are being scanned into the system. So we need to follow along how that strategy is working and whether or not it is an adequate way to move forward as we try to remain vigilant across the board to oversee that we have consistent progress. So thank you, Chairman Chaffetz, for your continued oversight on that. Thank you for the witnesses for being here today to uh, help us bring us up to date on what is going on. And I look forward to continued process where we work together to try to make sure that our veterans get the services and programs they deserve. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, this is truly uh, bipartisan in our approach. I know we are all concerned about uh, the health and welfare of our veterans, and uh, uh, we will continue vigilance. Uh, it's, I think it is one of our duties and, and responsibilities. Uh, in the essence of time, I am going to submit my uh, opening statement for the record, uh, but let me just uh, simply say we have a problem and, and we need solutions. And um, I know the Veterans Affairs Committee is looking deeply into this. We will continue to look into this. Uh, but we have a problem, and, and uh, it doesn't seem to be getting better, and thus the, the essence of the hearing today. Uh, members will have seven days to submit opening statements for the record, and we'd now like to recognize our, our first and only panel. Uh, I will also note that uh, you know, there was an attempt here <laughs> to have somebody additional sit on the panel. Uh, we notice these things in advance. Uh, we need to adhere to that. Um, so the panel that we have here today uh, while I appreciate the, the desire to have somebody else uh, join you at the, at the table today, we just simply can't do that on the whim the day of the hearing. We like to advance to, to notice these things in advance. So our witnesses today include the Honorable Allison Hickey, who is the Undersecretary for Benefits at the Department of Veterans Affairs, Mr. Gerald Menar, who is the Deputy Director of National Veterans Service for the <laughs> Veterans of Foreign Wars, and Mr. Joseph Violante, who is the National Legislative Director for the Disabled American Veterans. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn before they testify. If you would please rise and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Please let the record reflect that witnesses have answered in the affirmative. In order to allow, allow time for uh, discussion and for member inquiry, uh, we would appreciate if you would uh, reserve your, your verbal comments to, to five minutes. Uh, your entire record um, uh, will be submitted uh, for the record. But at this time, we will now recognize uh, the Under Secretary uh, for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, members of the subcommittee. I am accompanied today by Mr. Roger Baker, the Assistant Secretary for Information and Technology. My testimony will focus on our comprehensive and integrated transformation plan, which will ensure timely and accurate delivery of benefits and services to our veterans, their families, and survivors. We are committed to ensuring veterans do not have to wait too long to get the benefits they have earned and deserve. A prolonged wait is unacceptable. We are implementing a robust plan to fix the, the problem. Our transformation plan is critical to achieving our goal of processing all claims in 125 days with 98 percent accuracy in 2015. However, we are not waiting for 2015. We are already implementing our plan and have good early results. Our plan, our transformation plan, our new organizational model, our new processes, 
our new technology will be implemented at 56 regional offices by 60 of them by this September 30th and all the remaining by the end of the calendar year next year. The claims backlog is a decades old problem and fixing it isn't easy. If you have ever walked into one of our regional offices, your regional offices, you have seen stacks and stacks of paper. No, we are not computerized yet. We are starting to get right now computerized um, uh, with our new plan. Our task, our transformation plan is to eliminate this antiquated paper-bound process that does not serve our veterans who are frustrated by its lack and spe of speed and transparency. We have an aggressive plan to ensure our veterans get the timely and accurate benefit decisions they need and have earned. VA completed a record 1 million claims per year the last two fiscal years, and we are on target to complete another million this year. Yet the receipts continue to greatly outnumber the outputs, meaning we have more veterans making more claims. In 2009, we completed 900,000 claims while a million came in. In 2010, we completed a million claims, which was unprecedented in history but we received another 1.2 million claims. In 2011, we completed another million claims, while at the same time allocating 37 percent of our rating staff across the nation to process those most important Vietnam veteran Agent Orange claims. We provided benefits to over 132,000 Vietnam veterans and their survivors in the last two years that did not get it over the last 50. Still, 1.3 million claims came in the door. Given the anticipated continued high level of claims receipt, it is absolutely clear to us that continuing our legacy paper-bound process will not eliminate the backlog. We have an aggressive plan that builds a strong foundation for a paperless digital disability claim system, a lasting solution that will transform how we operate and eliminate the backlog. Our plan will ensure we achieve the Secretary's goal and this agency's priority goals of completion in 125 days all claims at a 98 percent accuracy level in 2015, delivering faster, better decisions for veterans. We are retraining, reorganizing, streamlining processes, and implementing technology solutions that are positively implementing veterans today. Here are some highlights. We are redeploying 1,200 of our most experienced raiders who were doing those Agent Orange claims to target and tackle the backlog now. These employees will complete 100,000 backlog claims by the end of this year. We have improved and are expanding training practices to make staff better equipped to handle today's difficult cases. We call it challenge training and it works. New staff have already received this design training, are completing two and a half times more claims per day with more than 30 percent increase in their accuracy quality levels. By the end of July, we will have put 16 regional offices into our new operating model, changing the way we are organized to do this work. This model with segmented lane lets us organize that work into three distinct lanes. One, focused on special emphasis of at-risk veterans. Another, doing those easier to do one to two contention express claims. Once fully implemented, we will have all our offices in this by 2013, 16 by the end of this year. That will give us an additional 200,000 claims we can do per year. Also working closely with DOD to ensure a seamless transition for our separating service members. In 2012 alone, we reduced during this administration the days from a 260-day average to a 56-day average this year for more than 10,000 or over half of those claims. We are ensuring service members receive access to benefits, e-benefits. We have had an increase of 500 percent accounts. More than 1.7 million service members and veterans are on e-benefits today getting the information they need on their claim, to file a claim, to, get, to download numerous numbers of letters as well. We are ending our reliance on paper-based claims and rolling out the new paper-based uh, system, VBMS, which is already deployed, already deployed in four regional offices, R Providence, Rhode Island. In your uh, city, Chairman, it's Salt Lake City, Utah, Fort Harrison, Montana, and Wichita, Kansas, and it works. In pilot programs, the new system has cut the average time to process a claim to 119 days, well below the 125 mark in 2015. Twelve more offices are on it by 30 September this year, all 56 by the end of 2013. The bottom line, Chairman, 
Members of this committee, we must deliver timely, first-rate benefit services with greater efficiency and effectiveness than we do today. We cannot do it by using old tools and processes that we have been using up to this point. We are implementing that plan today. Mr. Chairman, it concludes my statement. I am pleased to answer any questions you or the members of the subcommittee have. Thank you. We will now go to uh, Mr. Menard. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. On behalf of the more than 2 million members of the Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States and our auxiliaries, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the VBA claims transformation process. Edmund Burke wrote that those who do not know history are destined to repeat it. It is for that reason that we discuss at length in our written testimony the historical events which greatly influenced and contributed to the over 2 million pending claims, adjud adjudicative actions, and appeals that make up the VBA workload today. Congressional inaction, institutional practices within VA, leadership lapses, managerial ineptness, legislative initiatives, administrative actions, court decisions by this score, and economic hard times have all come together in the last two decades to create this workload. Let's talk about solutions to this problem. First, there is no magic bullet. There is no one solution which will suddenly allow VBA employees to make quality decisions in a timely manner. VA has tried many times and many ideas in the last few years. It is important to distinguish marginal programs from potential game changers. We should recognize that VBA has yet to determine what is the optimal claims processing system for today. It has experimented with case management in several offices. While processing time improved, this model proved to be resource intensive. Lean claims processing pioneered in Little Rock improved workflow within the regional office and provided opportunities for continuous learning. However, only marginal improvements were shown over time. Just one week ago, VA trumpeted the creation of specialized teams, or lanes, for processing the bulk of claims within select regional offices. While some cases may be decided more quickly, we are aware of nothing in this initiative which will ensure higher quality decisions and significant improvements in timeliness. These initiatives address certain problems and produce some results. However, none in our view are expected to have a significant impact on either quality or production. The Simplified Notification Letter Program is designed to allow rating specialists to work more rapidly, and it does. Despite changes directed by uh, General Hickey, our recent reviews of decisions made under the SNL program show a failure to fully comply with VA directives. VA is required by law to provide veterans with the reasons and bases for the decisions made in their cases. While the SNL program provides generic reasons for decisions, these are not adequate to meet the requirements of the law. As a result, we have renewed our opposition to the SNL initiative until full compliance with the law is achieved. VBMS is the VBA's foundation for a 21st century claims processing system. It is intended to be sufficiently flexible to allow the addition of programs both now and in the future. VBMS is designed to facilitate the creation of efficiencies. However, we do not expect significant improvements in claims processing timeliness or quality immediately following deployment. If history is any guide, VBMS will actually slow claims processing during the first six months following full deployment as software problems are identified and fixed. VBA has stated that VBMS will be rolled out to 12 more regional offices by September. We strongly urge VBA to fix known problems before rolling VBMS out to additional offices. Many problems continue to slow development of this massive undertaking. It was only last week that VBA met with service organization subject matter experts for two days to define VSO requirements for access to VBMS. A significant number of problems must be resolved so that our service officers can fully access records in VBMS so that we can represent veterans before VA. These are not new problems. VFW service officers in three VBMS offices still cannot access veteran records processed in VBMS. There can be no misunderstanding. VBA must see this through to conclusion. VA has no alternatives, no fallback position. It must succeed in creating a fully functioning, veteran-centric, interactive, user-friendly, and highly agile claims uh, processing system. Failure to do this will have dire consequences for the future of VBA and veterans' benefits programs. Further, VBMS should not be deployed without full and complete access by VSOs to all records of veterans and other claimants for whom we hold a power of attorney. Failure to provide full and complete access at any point in this process means that veterans are denied due process and are deprived of the representation allowed by law. We believe that VBMS has the potential to be the game changer, but only if it is done right and only if VBA creates the best work process that works in this totally new electronic environment. 
This must be done in tandem to take advantage of the potential efficiencies and capability, uh, capabilities of this new information technology. We have worked closely with General Hickey to address our concerns. We have great respect for her leadership and vision for VBA. We will continue working with VA to resolve problems they arise so that veterans, their families, and survivors receive correct decisions in a timely manner from VA. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony this morning. I will be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. appreciate it. Now, we will now recognize for five minutes Mr. Violante. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the Disabled American Veterans and our 1.2 million members, thank you for this opportunity to present testimony about the VA claims processing system. DAV has the Nation's largest service program, which last year provided free representation to nearly a quarter million veterans and their families, assisting them in obtaining over $4 billion in new and retroactive benefits to which they were entitled. By helping veterans file more complete and accurate applications for benefits, DAV and other VSOs also aid VA by reducing their workload and helping them reach the right decisions for veterans. Mr. Chairman, the problems plaguing the VA claims processing system are well known. The number of claims filed each year is growing. The complexity of claims filed is increasing. The backlog of claims pending is staggering, and the quality of claims decisions remains far too low. These problems did not arise over the past year or the past four years or, for that matter, over the past 10 years, nor will they disappear this year or next. Earlier this year, the Veterans Benefits Administration began rolling out its new operating model and technology solutions to regional offices, but it is far too soon to make judgment about whether they are or will be successful, although Congress must continue to play an important role in holding VBA accountable through aggressive oversight, such as today's hearings. VBA must be allowed to complete this transformation process. For two years, Secretary Shinseki has focused on achieving the ambitious goal of having zero claims pending more than 125 days and all claims completed to 98 percent accuracy standards. While the elimination of the backlog will be a welcome milestone, we must remember eliminating the backlog is not the same goal as transforming the claims process system, nor does it guarantee that veterans are better served. The backlog is a symptom, not the root cause. In order to achieve real and lasting success, VBA must instead remain focused on creating a claims process system that is carefully designed to get each claim done right the first time. One of the most positive developments in recent years has been the open and candid attitude of VBA's leadership, particularly under Secretary Hickey, towards developing a true partnership with DAV and other VSOs who assist veterans in filing claims. Although she has only been in her position for a little over a year, we have been impressed with her leadership style that is shaking up entrenched bureaucrats who have long resisted change. Mr. Chairman, regardless of the new process or technologies employed, we firmly believe that the key to success in helping veterans receive timely and accurate decisions on benefit claims and ultimately the key to VA's success is building a culture focused on quality and accountability, and that begins with an unwavering commitment to education and training. DAV continues to recommend that VBA significantly increase the hours devoted to annual training and that all employees, coaches and managers undergo regular testing to measure job skills and knowledge as well as the effectiveness of the training. Perhaps the most critical element to the success of VBA's transformation strategy is new technology, especially VBMS system, which is being rolled out nationally with full development deployment scheduled for the end of 2013. We have been pleased with VBA's 
efforts to incorporate the experience and perspective of our organization through VBMS development process, and we continue to work with VA to help ensure that all the capabilities needed to do the job ahead. One major concern we have is their use of the simplified notification letters, or SNLs, which provide automated and simplified uh, rating decisions and notification letters. Many of the SNLs we have reviewed contain so little information and explanation that even an experienced DAV NSO has difficulty determining if the rating decision was correct. While we want automation and rules-based decisions, support to be a central part of the new claims process, VBA must not use technology to increase productivity at the cost of accuracy and quality. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That ends my statement. I will be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And again, to all, th all three of you, if you have uh, additional uh, testimony that you would like to add, we would be happy to add that to the record. I would now like to recognize myself for, for five <coughs> minutes. Uh, Madam Under Secretary, um, Mr. Menar, I think, accurately points out in his testimony that in order to solve the problem, you need to know exactly what the, the problem is. And I, I see a, uh, a major discrepancy in some of the numbers in the, in the, um, and I, I want to help clarify, help clarify that. In your testimony, uh, in talking about the integrated disability evaluation system, uh, you say, quote, we went from 240-day average in the legacy system to 56 days, and it goes on. Um, and yet, and there is a definition of, of the backlog. Um, the House Armed Services Committee staff and the House Veterans Affairs Committee staff on July 13 uh, of this year, which is not too long ago, uh, gave a briefing uh, to these two committees. And it, it says in here that the uh, current monthly average completion time is 408 days. You say it's 56 days, 54 days, yeah, 56 days, um, and they say it's 408 days. Can you help clarify that for me, please? Thank you, uh, Chairman Chaffetz, for your question. First of all, let me just start by clarifying a few basic definitions for us all so as I say things, you can understand what words I'm using in their context. Uh, we have uh, in the inventory and pending um, an overall number of 854,000. That's not backlog. Those are claims that even as we have been sitting here for the last 10 to 15 minutes, more claims have come in to us from veterans service members uh, and survivors. Okay, okay. Let me stop, let me stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. On July 16th, which is not very long ago, the Monday morning workload report says there are 919,461 claims. You say that number is, eight, what did you say it was, 860-something? Uh, the numbers that I'm using are 854,000. Okay, so we're off by about 50 or 60,000, uh, and we're talking about something that's just a couple days old. Why the discrepancy on those numbers? Uh, Chairman Chaffetz, uh, our backlog, I mean, our inventory is a dynamic um, I know, inventory. but we're talking about a <laughs> dy will... dynamism here of, of, of less than 10 days, so... Chairman, I'm happy to answer the questions if I'm allowed an opportunity to sure, do Sure. I want to know that what you're saying that that number is 800 and something thousand, and I'm just saying that the VA's Monday morning workload report says it's 919,461. That's of July 16th. Uh, Chairman, I'm happy to answer that question if allowed to answer the question. Ma just Thank you. answer the question. Thank yes. you very much. This is the time. That's why I asked the question. Please Thank answer Thank you very it. much, Chairman. Um, the, the numbers that I'm using are from an endpoint of a month probably the end of May. Okay. So you I, probably are using the end of your, this week's uh, report. I chose not to use a floating number that continues to change over time and over dates and over weeks. So I used an end-of-month number to be able to come talk to you, to be able to have a solid number to, to have a discussion around. If you can regardless help. of what it is, regardless of what it is, I will tell you that our inventory and our pending is not our backlog, and typically whether the statistics show 61 percent of that backlog are supplemental claims that people, veterans who are already receiving compensation from us um, are coming back with a second, a third, or a fourth 
uh, claim in that process. So of the number I will use, 854,000, I could use your number as well. Then I could use the weekly, down, the weekly reports number in backlog. It would be exactly the same thing, which is about 65 to 66 percent of our claims are in backlog, meaning they are more than 125 days old. Okay, uh, so, so okay, that that, the, uh, that's that great. Okay, more than 125 days old. You say in your testimony, I mean, to hear your testimony, these things are getting so much better. We went from a 240 day average in the legacy system to 56 days. Chairman Chaffetz, I'd be happy to answer the question and the disparity for the briefing, which you just hand, handed up. I have different processes that have different standards. The process you described is our in, uh, integrated disability evaluation system that we work with DOD for our most wounded and ill and injured service members. In your testimony. The numbers that you are describing no. are the VA, the 56 days are the VA numbers in that um, complete process I, for which I'm, VA has the responsibility hold on, for completing the claim. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's tackle them one at a time. Quote, this is your testimony. We are so closely collaborating with DOD through the Integrated Disability Evaluation System. You say that's 56 days. This report, this briefing that went to another committee just last week says it's 408 days. That's not exactly close. Which one is it? Is it Chairman, if it's the VA days for those 10,000 we have done in FY12, the VA days, the days that I have responsibility for doing them are 56 for those 10,000. Are you saying that this is accurate or inaccurate? Do you think I'm saying I do not know what's on that slide. If you were to give me the slide and have me a chance to digest that slide, I'd be happy to do that, Chairman. Uh, you have access to that information right at this will, moment. I do not. I will be happy to take it for the record and respond to you. How, in its simplified format here, how bad do you think this problem is? I, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to quantify it, and, and, and I'm concerned because we're not off by a couple hundred people here. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. And in your testimony, you would lead the American people believe that it's getting much better. But if you look at it over the course of time, it's getting worse. It's Chairman getting Chaffetz, worse. I have clearly stated in my testimony that, two, that um, uh, 65 percent of people in more than 125 days from a VA perspective is unacceptable. I have clearly stated that. And you say that this is a decades old problem. And I, it is a decades old problem. And for the first time, we have an integrated plan that goes after the way we are organized and trained to do the work, the processes that we have done that we have streamlined, the technology that we are bringing in that under this administration and this secretary, VBA has never had an emphasis on its IT infrastructure to get from a paper-bound process to a paperless system than we do right now. We are implementing it right now. Okay. I, I, my time has far expired. I, the, the, the numbers and the discrepancies here are absolutely stunning. I will now yield to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, Mr. Benar, Mr. Violante, you have been working with uh, Ms. Hickey? on a regular basis. I would like you to just give me some idea of your level of confidence uh, in the partnership that your organizations have with the Department right now. I have been in this town for close to 30 years working on veterans' issues, uh, 20 on the legislative staff for disabled American veterans. And I can tell you that this is the first time we have had the type of relationship that we do. It is open. It is candid. We get brought in to the process much earlier than in the past, and we have a dialogue. And um, with that dialogue, there are things that are changed. There are some that aren't. But uh, I feel very comfortable with the fact that we have this relationship now um, with the Undersecretary that hopefully will be in the best interest of veterans. Mr. Benai? Uh, I can certainly echo those, those remarks. Um, I've I have known, um, uh, worked for uh, a significant number of, of undersecretaries for benefit, and, um, and General Hickey is, is by far the, um, uh, the, the most energetic uh, and, and most focused uh, undersecretary that, that I have had uh, any dealings with uh, at all. She, uh, our relationship with her uh, is, is based on, uh, on openness. Um, she listens to what we say, uh, our concerns. Um, we do not always agree, and I would not expect uh, that we would. But, um, but the fact that, that we can resolve many problems without issuing press releases or standing on the steps of the Capitol building and, and holding a press conference um, tells us that, that you know, it is a much better relationship than, 
than anything we have experienced in uh, many, many years. So that is a good start. Uh, I, I would assume on that. And, and uh, Madam Secretary, I, I commend you for that. I think it is so important that you work with our veterans and their representatives in this kind of an operation on that. I do hear that there is a problem with the simplified uh, notification letters. Can I assume that that is being worked on? Uh, or is that hard and fixed, never going to change? Secretary? Uh, uh, Congressman Tierney, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, simplified notification letters and the involvement we did have and appreciate the involvement of uh, Mr. Menar in this process. Uh, that idea, frankly, was born from the gentleman that sits to your side. Uh, when I would do, was doing my walk-arounds, I had the, for, uh, the wonderful opportunity to meet with Congressman Braley, who pointed out in my very first meeting with him uh, the superb work and effort that he had done on the Plain Writing Act of 2010 that mandates uh, that Federal agencies who talk to their constituencies, in our case our veterans, family members, and survivors, uh, do so in plain, simple, language rather than convoluted legalese and uh, medical jargon. Um, I saw that the very first moment I met him, I left that office, took it back and said, why don't we do this? Why aren't we doing this in VA? One of the results of that is the simplified notification letter. The simplified notification letter, letter by the way, is also the, conv the convoluted letters we had were the number two reason our veterans called us on our call agent, our 1-800 number. And sometimes the number one reason they called our offices. Absolutely. <laughs> they said to me, explain these letters. I will tell you, as a veteran that retired in 2007 and got these two letters that was confused by them as well, that we needed to tackle that issue. And I appreciate what Congressman Braley had done under the, the, this Act to give us uh, an extra push to do this. Here is what the results were, because we didn't just do this in PowerPoint. We didn't just make it a fluffy idea that we just went and implemented. We implemented this new process in a live regional office and then a second one. The first time, before we had the great input from Mr. Menard, I got 33 percent more claims out of that regional office than I had before implementing that initiative. Uh, respected uh, the, Mr. Menard's input to say there is not enough information in this letter. We adjusted the letter to add more free text into that letter to let that veteran hear a little bit, inform, uh, little bit more information without getting back to the 10-page term papers we were sending these veterans and they were struggling through. I lost about half of the lift I got out of that process, but I'm willing to accept 15 percent is nothing to sneeze at. When it has allowed us, since we've implemented it one March, to decrease the ratings waiting to be um, awarded by 12 percent in four months, by 12 percent. I have done 30,000 more claims in four months by doing this process. Yes, I acknowledge the concerns of my VSO partners, and I call them partners because I need them to go through this process. I acknowledge their concerns that sometimes our employees aren't filling in that new little text box uh, the way they should. We are working that hard. I have made an investment in quality review teams in every single regional office, and they have that responsibility to make sure we are doing it right. And I have asked his, regional, his uh, folks in the offices to help us and point to the ones that don't make sense. Thank you very Thank much. You. I yield back. Thank you. And I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Under Secretary, I realize you all are working very hard to streamline uh, the, the process and get these uh, claims handled faster. But it is not just disability claims that uh, are some of the complaints that I am hearing from veterans in South Texas. It is the amount of time necessary to uh, seek. Uh, to get medical attention. I hear from VA uh, employees uh, more or less off the record that they are having trouble uh, hiring and maintaining uh, physicians to work in their uh, hospitals and clinics. And I am hearing from doctors back home that it is taking in uh, excess of a year sometimes to get payments on vouchers from uh, the VA. Are, can, can you talk a little bit about what is being done to uh, address these problems as well? Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Fernholt, for your question. I will say that I am on the benefit side, but I certainly hear about the work they are doing on the health side um, very frequently. Uh, I know uh, that uh, Dr. Petzl, who is the Under Secretary for Health, is working uh, very, very uh, um, heavily on making sure all of his physician positions are filled. I know we have a big push on hiring, and we are seeing in great many of your locations they are having some good effort on hiring uh, 5,000 mental health professionals um, in, in rapid order, and they are making some really good headway and getting some really strong candidates across the nation. I believe that will help. Uh, this is not my obvious area right. of responsibility, 
but and I, I believe that will help. I guess what, what I'm getting at and what concerns me is, and uh, maybe we'll address this to our veteran service representatives, Mr. Menard and Mr. Violante, is, is there a culture within the VA of, well, we'll, we'll get it done eventually, uh, as, as opposed to what I think it, it, it should be, a, you know, if we need to stay late to finish this work for our veterans, uh, we need to do that. Can, would either one of you gentlemen like to uh, comment on that? Thank you, Congressman. I, I, I believe that the majority of VA employees are dedicated employees that do what they need to do to ensure that veterans are taken care of. Over the years, the problem has been underfunding of the VA health care system. Um, we were able to get advanced appropriations in place for VA, which has helped greatly, but we're still seeing that there are insufficient funds for VA to hire the people that need to be hired um, and to uh, ensure that veterans are getting the proper access. Uh, and I understand that funds are an issue for everything. Unfortunately, uh, it's not a bottomless pit in the federal uh, government as far as money goes. It's something that uh, we obviously in Congress are struggling with. But I think if you look at how we have addressed uh, budgets, the v we have been uh, very generous to the VA as compared to some of the other uh, agencies. And Mr. Menard, you also mentioned in uh, in your uh, written uh, testimony, or actually in, in your testimony, that there were some things that Congress had failed to do. I would be interested in what you think we have failed to do uh, in, in Congress that has adversely affected our veterans. Uh, thank you. As I have pointed out in, in my, my written testimony, um, the, the failure to pass budgets on time, uh, it's, it's no secret. It happens. Um, You're on the wrong side of the Capitol yeah. making that argument. I'm, 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 <laughs> uh, when, when I I understand. It's, it's a joint problem, okay? Uh, but uh, continuing resolutions uh, it, it become a nightmare for for um, uh, the v, uh, VBA and people in the regional offices. Uh, in my prior life, uh, I worked for the VA for a little over 30 years. I was a manager in Los Angeles uh, and had 150 people working for me. And I can tell you, in the in the 80s and 90s, uh, whenever there was a failure to pass a budget on time, uh, we were put into a hiring freeze. And in Los Angeles. We were experiencing, on average, 10 to 15 percent turnover every year. In that kind of situation where you wait sometimes three or four months, sometimes an entire year or more before you are allowed to hire, you, you wind up with, with huge gaps in, in, um, in, in employee positions and in employee development. Uh, it's, and it cascades over years. It is not the kind of thing where um, if it happens once every five years, you can make adjustments and live with it. This is a problem that, that is uh, nearly constant, uh, according to uh, reports that have uh, that I've seen uh, that and uh, information I've uh, put in my testimony. And let, let me ask Ms. Hickey, and it, it's been pointed out that you know part of the problem is it, take, it it's a complicated system. There there are lots of things you've got to look at. How long does it take to get an employee up to speed where uh, he or she can uh, be be effective in their job and uh, and, and, and get them trained to do that? So thank you, Congressman, uh, for the question. And it allows me to talk about one of our transformation initiatives was fundamentally changing that. In the past, it would be 18 months to two years to get someone to a full journey level capability to rate a case. Uh, what I will tell you under our new challenge training, uh, where we are taking our folks and giving them national level training, intensive level training, uh, we are seeing some phenomenal results. Uh, and we have repeated it four times, so I know it is not a fluke. And is, is, are they able to work with your medical professionals on the side? I mean, how much do you trust the doctors in the military or your own VA doctors to, uh, to, to make those determinations versus uh, independent work that your staff has to do? So, uh, so, Congressman, uh, I will tell you, we always depend on the medical opinion that comes to us and the medical exam that comes to us from a trained medical uh, person and certified person. We do not make those decisions on our own. We rely heavily on our uh, health administration physicians who do our compensation exams and tell us the results, even now our clinical doctors. I will also tell you, with the new disability benefit questionnaires, another transformation effort we are doing, we now have the ability for private medical physicians to bring, uh, uh, for our veterans to bring us those, uh, those um, documents fully filled out and for us to use them in the course of doing our claim adjudication. I am way over time. I appreciate everyone's testimony and, and their hard work for those who uh, have served our country. 
Thank you. We will now recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Brilley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Hickey, Madam Undersecretary, thank you for your kind words. I didn't come here looking for them, but I think your comments about the impact of the Plain Writing Act, which applies to every federal agency, not just the VA, are an example of why agencies need to do a better job of eliminating legalese and gobbledygook in their writing so that their intended audience actually understands what is being told to them. And I am glad that the impact of those changes is having a positive impact on your agency. Um, one of the things that I can tell you is I am very honored to serve on both Veterans Affairs and the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. And we talk about this problem on Veterans Affairs all the time. It is the number one issue my veterans back in Iowa talk to me about. But as someone who spent my entire adult life dealing with disability evaluation systems, I can tell you a lot of people who complain about this problem have very, very little understanding of the scope and magnitude of the problem. So if you are standing in front of a claims file that could reach this high of records from someone who may have had multiple amputations, traumatic brain injury, and treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, over a long period of time, and you are trying to go through and analyze medical information to determine the nature and extent of somebody's disability impairment rating, and you are doing that by hand, it is a far more time-consuming process than when you have the capability of doing word searches in an electronic format. And one of the things that we know is by moving away from this paper-based system to a paperless electronic system will hopefully greatly simplify the ability of ratings analysts to get the information they need in a timely basis. Because you have to establish, first of all, a service-connected disability, then an injury that is related, then you have to prove the nature and extent of the impairment of each single injury, then you have to determine what that impact is on a whole body impairment. These are very confusing things to the people being evaluated, let alone to some of the evaluators. So my hope is that this process that is in place is going to get us to the point where we can radically shorten and simplify the time it takes. But it also comes down to what Mr. Menar and Mr. Violenti were talking about, which is the culture of we can do this that I believe has been missing for far too long in this process. There was a famous judge in Virginia, Bob Marriage, who started the rocket docket who would go in and clean, clean up claims backlogs in federal courts all over the country by changing the dynamic of how people in that process viewed their obligation to the people in the system. So I am interested in knowing, um, General, why you think the process that is in place right now is going to get you to where you need to be in the time frame set out. Thank you, Congressman Braley, uh, and thank you for description of uh, your real life experience with this issue, because that is what we face every single day. I literally have raiders sitting with little rubber fingertips uh, going through the 18 inches worth of paper to try to find the one time it says back in that record, and they are working hard to find that. But I also have raiders today on, in VBMS in, pile, in uh, four different sites um, who are putting the word back into a searchable function in VBMS, and it is highlighting the word back throughout that 18 inches of former paper that is now an image, and it is telling them by the push of a next, next, next button where it is in that 18 inches and solving all that time and effort. In addition, it is allowing them to sit and write with their fancy tools they now have in VBMS, annotations, circle it so that when our VSOs want to see the reasons for our base, for reasons for our decisions or really know what the data is we looked at, they can see it right away and they will be able to, by the way, when we deliver this month on the next, on the full round that we are going forth on VBMS. Why do I think it will work? Because none of, nothing in this plan is PowerPoint. We have tried it, tested it, measured it, gotten data on it and made a decision that together all of this will help us to go after this issue and knock it down. Thank you. Mr. Menar, Mr. Violenti, I am going to direct my last question to both of you, because you have both identified something that is very real, and that is, uh, Mr. Violenti, you said building a culture based on quality and accountability should be the goal, but it is impossible to do with insufficient funds. 
And it seems to me when we're talking about taking care of our veterans, you can't talk about implementing a dramatic new change in the system itself and then keep going back and wondering whether there's going to be enough money to pay for that transformation. So what concerns do you have on the funding side? Well, and we've asked the Veterans Affairs Committee to do some oversight on that because we want to make sure that the money that we're asking Congress to provide the VA is being used properly. Um, I, I can't tell you if the money they're putting into VBMS um, is appropriate. I can tell you we think what they're doing with VBMS is the way it should go. We've been arguing this point for a decade on searchable database, and uh, we'd like to see that happen. But, you know, again, we're, we are aware VA has been fortunate, uh, more fortunate than any other government um, department or agency, but we are sending men and women into situations that cause them to have problems, and this government needs to take care of those problems regardless of what that cost is. Mr. Menard. One of the things that we have suggested to committee staff members is that as part of the oversight function of the House Veterans Affairs Committee, that you commission an independent third party review to take a look at VBMS and its development, where it is at now, what problems are being addressed, how they are being addressed, whether whether the contractors that are using or the in-house personnel are, are uh, adequate to the task uh, and to come up with uh, recommendations so that, so that we, the, at this point the, 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 the program can be refined uh, and adjusted rather than wait till the end and, and find that, that there is a, a number of things, a number of problems that still exist, that still keep them from, from uh, achieving the, the timeliness and the quality uh, in work process that, uh, that they hope to achieve with this system. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you. Now recognize the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I don't have any questions. I yield Thank my you. time to you. Thank you. Um, uh, Madam Under Secretary, uh, the VA reported that it had awarded $2.8 million to 245 senior executives. Um, how, how do we justify that? I mean, that is a very small group of people. We got hundreds of thousands, close to a million veterans uh, waiting in line, and 245 people got $2.8 million in bonuses. How do we justify that? Chairman, Chairman Chaffetz, thank you for the question. First of all, um, I will tell you, in VBA, uh, since 2009, we have actually decreased by a full third the number of our SESs that are getting outstanding ratings. So we have done what this administration has asked us to do, which is to really scrutinize the ratings that we are giving uh, to our senior executives and bring them down. I will tell you from a VBA perspective, I have 98 metrics, performance metrics, that I rate every single one of our senior executives against. They are performance based, how, they are how production many, and quality how many, based. Uh, how, how, uh, and in those I, environments I, no. where I do have outstanding leaders, I need to keep those outstanding leaders. They are making a difference for our veterans, their family members and survivors. How, how many of them, uh, how many of the people that worked for you got those bonuses? Congressman, I will have to bring you the explicit information. I wasn't prepared to come and talk about bonus structure. Certainly can okay. have that data. Thank you. Happy okay. to share it with you. All right. Um, it is certainly not unanimous, this love fest for these simplified notification letters. Uh, in fact, Mr. Menar and Mr. Violante uh, both uh, commented in their written uh, statements that, uh, let me read, uh, Mr. Violante said, quote, many of the SNLs reviewed contain so little information and explanation that even an experienced uh, officer has difficulty determining if the rating decision was correct without reviewing the full file. And Mr. Menar, in his testimony, wrote, quote, with only general information provided by VA, veterans are, for, are faced with the choice of blindly accepting the decision uh, or filing a notice of disagreement in order to obtain the reasons for the decision, uh, end quote. Um, the concern is, you know, if you get 100 percent disability, you are probably going to agree with it. If you get a 5 or 10 percent, uh, you are probably going to have some questions. We are trying to find the proper balance between handing somebody so many documents um, and, and simplifying the process. But these two gentlemen here uh, certainly are, don't seem to be, based on those statements, fans of this. H how do we find that proper balance? 
So, Chairman Chaffetz, uh, thank you for your question. I will uh, uh, address it by, uh, by saying that I today provide access to our VSOs to every one of those files for them to do whatever research they want to do. They will have even greater access to knowing exactly the data and the, the information that we know when they are joining us this month on VBMS as we go into the new Veterans Benefit Management System. In addition, I have wholeheartedly encouraged, as we go through change, there's adjustments and adaptations. There's a learning process. I've wholly encouraged them at the local unit level when they have a service officer that find one that just doesn't have enough for them to go directly to that supervisor and say, need a little help here. There's not enough there. But don't, and we don't will handle that on the spot and we will train to that as we learn more and more about that. Don't you think that's contributing to the backlog? People I, say I they do not get back in line again to it say. It has not. In fact, it's handled on the spot and, it's, um, and it has reduced handled, our backlog by 30,000. You really, in you really think that veterans are, are convinced that it's just, quote, handled on the spot? I, I mean, our office, we, we get these all the time. Uh, Chairman this is Chaffer, not. For you to say exact, that they're just handled on the spot, Mr. Menar, how would you, is that true? Are they handled on the spot? Depending on the regional office and, and the individuals that our service officers deal with, they are sometimes handled on the spot. Uh, in other instances, uh, and it's rare, uh, our service officers are told if you don't like it, you can appeal it. Um, and then there's a wide range of, of, of uh, interactions in between. Our concern uh, isn't, uh, our, our, we're concerned about the SNL letters because uh, it, it's not just our service officers having to try and figure out why VA made a decision. Um, we train our, our people to do that, to, to go behind uh, and look at the data and, and basically reevaluate it and see if they would have arrived at the same conclusion. But, but um, perhaps uh, 50 percent of, of veterans don't, are not represented. So they have to, to accept whatever VA uh, gives them on blind faith or, or um, decide whether they are going to uh, appeal on their own. The, the, the point here, and I would like to say this, uh, General Hickey has been, been worked with us uh, sig significantly to try and improve these letters. She put out some directives last, last February uh, to the field that, that if those directives were followed, uh, the, the letters, they would be barely adequate in our view, but at least they would be adequate. Um, the problem is that when, when we have come along in, in April and May and looked at letters uh, and decisions that have been made uh, in many different offices, um, we are finding uh, a significant number, 50, 60 percent, that, that are not um, getting the job done. It is a pretty, pretty high number, Mr. Violante. I know I am past my time, but I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Then we will go to the gentleman from, from Illinois. Like Mr. Menard, I mean, we had similar experiences with regards to whether or not we can get something corrected on the spot, depending on the regional office and, and the employees. Uh, with regards to the uh, SNLs, we are not opposed to the concept. Um, we have seen some good ones come out, and we, we have brought the bad ones to uh, General Hickey's attention. But uh, you know, if they can work on that, there is a balance that needs to be done so that veterans can understand in a simplified way what the VA's decision is. Thank you. I will now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, for five thank, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Hickey, uh, getting back to something that Mr. Braley talked about, and that is um, uh, the electronic records or digital records or what have you, just to clarify, uh, in an ideal world, what is the format from which you get information from DOD on a veteran? Uh, thank you, Congressman Quigley. In an ideal world, I would get every bit of it electronic, data to data, directly into my system. Second best answer is put it on a CD disk and don't give it to me in paper. How much information do you get in an ideal format today? Electronically, yes. virtually none. I get most of it in paper. And, and uh, no editorials here, but uh, your understanding of whether DOD is moving that direction, is it your understanding that that's their intention, how far along they are in that vein? We are in conversation heavily on multiple fronts uh, with DOD uh, for all the different pieces of uh, evidence that they have for that service member. And in, in some places, uh, we are further ahead. I would tell you the electronic health record, uh, substantially further ahead from a, an established whole program management office, and they are marching that direction. Um, uh, from some of the personnel records and the existing service treatment records, we are beginning that discussion and, uh, and trying to drive a, a quick solution uh, home on that, in that regard. And I am optimistic that maybe someday we will we'll get to that point. Perhaps I am 
too optimistic because I'm a Cub fan. Um, <laughs> well, what exactly does that mean? One record, one record, all other things being equally, average time it saves you and, and gets to this, you know, to be able to make a decision between a stack of papers and a, a digital record. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for that question. I will tell you, yes, on average, our uh, days uh, today is 250 average days to complete a claim. 175 of those 250 days are we, VA, waiting for evidence we don't own. That's a significant reason why we need to get data, not paper, and we need to get access to systems, not wait for a monthly report that rolls to us that gives us that information. And I appreciate that. Uh, I also understand that there is a disparity between the different regions of the country uh, about what you get in terms of a fully developed claim. Uh, can you talk about just what I, I understand that the, the veterans work with the VSOs, but you have a far better record in some areas, uh, without offending anyone, than others. And you know, can you explain the difference that makes and what we can do about that? Absolutely, Congressman Quigley. And this goes to uh, uh, a bigger issue. Let me first say by uh, say uh, that your particular regional office in Chicago. Um, uh, is one of our stellar examples of uh, VSOs working, veteran service officers, state directors, county service officers working closely with the regional office to bring in something we call fully developed claim, which means we have partners helping us gather all that evidence and putting it together and giving it to us. And when we do that, we do those claims at substantially less time. In fact, it's 117 days on average to do that, well below the 125 mark. Another great example is our uh, Togus, Maine office, where those uh, state representatives, those VSOs, have driven a 43 percent of every claim that comes in the door is, is a fully developed claim. And that makes a difference on our timeliness, that makes a difference on our quality, and frankly, in our new organizational model, I can put those down the express lane and get them done quickly. Now, it is fair to assume that veterans are veterans wherever they are from across the country. So. Um what accounts for the difference between uh, developing a fully developed claim in one area versus another otherwise? Is it just the training, the information, the management aspects of what is taking place in those areas? Congressman Quig Quigley, we are working, uh, actually uh, just uh, started a pretty uh, in-depth uh, exchange with our veteran service officers and our state directors, pulling some of these benchmark uh, regional offices and their, the folks that are working with them into a team to say, tell us how you are doing this so that we can replicate this level of contribution of fully developed claim in lots of other places. So uh, we will be asking your Chicago regional office and your state and, and the local VSO in Chicago to join us. We will be asking the main ones who have done such a great job, uh, I mean in Chicago, Togus, got the names right, uh, to come and help us. I don't know explicitly, but I need to drive those fully de developed claims up much higher uh, than we have them today. I think on average we get about 3 percent nationally if I, if I do an average over, uh, over the whole um, mix. 3 percent of them we are getting in right now today fully developed. I am willing to do whatever barriers I have to break down to have our, uh, our partners in our VSOs and our State Veterans Affairs offices to help us do that and, and to help that veteran. And if, Mr. Chairman, if it is appropriate, if, you could, if, Mr., if the other two gentlemen wish to comment on those two points. I mean, one of the things, too, you need to consider with the fully developed claim is who is filing the claim. I mean, I have been out of the military now for 40 years. And if I was going to file a claim saying that I had an injury back in the military, it would be hard for me as an individual to try to go back and contact all those doctors that I saw. And that makes it difficult. So if you are a younger veteran just getting out or someone that has been in the same area all your life, it is a lot easier mm -hmm. to get that fully developed claim together than it is in some other cases. Another impediment for service officers is, is their very caseload. Uh, at a time when, when there are so many claims pending before the VA, um, the, the question is how much time can they devote to a, a single individual to, to work with them to, to make a, help make a case fully developed. So in, in some of our offices where, where service officer caseload is extremely high, I would expect that, um, that uh, they would have uh, lower percentages of, of uh, cases that are fully developed. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. We will now recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, for five minutes. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling this hearing, uh, and I thank uh, all of the witnesses who are here uh, for your uh, good work. It's very, very challenging. Uh, I appreciate that. The bag backlog is a problem. A couple of things. One, in Vermont, uh, we process in Vermont most of our uh, local claims, not the pension claims, in that local administration uh, has a better turnaround time uh, in Vermont than the national average. General Hickey, do you have plans to try to facilitate local administration of claims, which in our case certainly seems to have a better outcome? So thank you, Congressman Welch, for your question. I will tell you nationally, we still do that model everywhere. We still have local adjudication of claims. I think what you might, if I can you know, offer, uh, what you might be talking about is the pension claim consolidation we have done into the three centers. Well, I want to get to that. That's correct, because the pension claims uh, in our case are done in Philadelphia, and the turnaround time is pretty slow. And we have had some very, very tough situations, including uh, one uh, family that contacted our office. and. Uh, uh, this uh, woman, uh, the mother of uh, Howard Hoy, who, the son who had uh, uh, contacted us, they had a claim that uh, just wasn't answered for years, and it wasn't until after the mother died, and this was her trying to get pension benefits from uh, what she was entitled to as the survivor. Uh, it wasn't until after he died that they they uh, they, they adjudicated this. Uh, what is the uh, what are the prospects for m m f moving this much more quickly on the pension side? Uh, so thank you, uh, uh, Congressman, for your question. I will tell you one of the reasons why we consolidated those claims so we could put better oversight, uh, that is very applicable to this committee, on uh, that work, which was frankly being uh, overshadowed by compensation uh, work when it was uh, being done in the regional office. Uh, we did, as a result of doing that, increase the quality of those decisions substantially. They are now up at 98 percent. I am not happy with the fact that we are not moving some of those claims fast. Well, Neither are the people who are working them, and we have just to, some decision. We have a team that is no, putting I, together. I, under, I understand your concern. I am just trying to get to understand this. In the case of this claim, it was, the application was logged in as received on May of 2010, but it sat literally untouched for six months. What would be the system problem that allowed this claim to be sat on touch for six months? Congressman Welch, I would be happy to take that specific one or any other specific ones you have and go look at them. I can't make a, a, a judgment um, on that particular case. There's oftentimes other issues, and I would be happy to take it for the record and get your response back well, very quickly. It, it might be helpful just so that I understand what the challenges are that uh, you face and your system faces. You know, it, it worked after this woman di uh, died. Uh, she got a condolence letter like almost immediately. So one, <laughs> one part of the system was working, but the, the part that really would have been uh, beneficial to her during her life was not working. So maybe we can incorporate that uh, condolence system that seemed to work immediately into the pension review system that did not. Uh, Congressman, I'm happy to take that, uh, that and look at it and get you a good response. Okay. Uh, you're, you're, you're providing us with a copy of your strategic plan. Uh, I am, Congressman. Um, the uh, House Veteran Affairs Committee asked me to produce the plan. I have the plan. Great. Uh, when I went back to uh, get the plan to send it over, I realized there are 14 and 15 budget numbers in there. I'm not allowed to release those 14 and 15 budget numbers at this point in time. So we scrubbed those out and we recirculated it back through the approval process so that it can arrive okay. here. I don't, th uh, thank you very much, General. Uh, Mr. Uh, Menard, in June, of, in June 19th hearing before the Veteran Affairs Committee, you were uh, pretty vocal uh, about your support of the VBA's initiatives overall. What it, what, how could the VA improve? <laughs> a broad question. Um, how can the VA improve? Well, it is a broad question, but presumably you have thought about it a lot, so the one, two, three would be you know, very concrete suggestions. Otherwise, it is just the general discussion that doesn't well, get specific. Oh, all right. Um, how can VA improve? The, the, the emphasis right now is on production. Um, everybody is, is appalled at, at the, um, call it inventory, backlog, workload, however you want to call it. Uh, it is a huge number. Uh, and, and as you have seen in our, our testimony, um, uh, both written and oral, we, we <clears throat> use the, the two million plus a number of uh, claims and issues pending because because all of those things have to be processed by VBA personnel and 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 uh, those are the same people who 
who uh, work the front and the back end of rating cases. So um, if those were to go away, you'd certainly have a lot more people focused on, on, um, on development uh, and, and processing uh, uh, award decisions, and, and everything would move more quickly. So it's all part of the part of the the, the backlog, the the, the workload. Um, what would what would we suggest? A f focus on quality. Um, we're we're appalled as uh, as uh, was uh, as uh, some other members were in, in, mentioned earlier about the uh, the uh, high quality uh, low quality rate, a uh, high error rate, uh, sixteen percent nationally. In some offices, it's as poor as twenty five percent. If you go uh, look at uh, the, the accuracy reports from, from um, six or eight months ago, uh, before some changes were made in Baltimore for, for several years, they were rocking along at a, a 30 or 33 percent error rate on ratings. Um, it is totally unacceptable, and, and, and those kinds of problems are, are easily, easily corrected. Uh, but they have a, the, the, the correction requires an impact on production, which means that, that VBA managers are reluctant to, to take those actions. Um, what I would suggest is that, that uh, uh, especially for trainees, but for, for anyone who, who has um, uh, uh, quality issues uh, identified, they need to have their ratings uh, um, uh, reviewed by a second person. Now, I know that that takes place um, uh, mentoring for, for new people for a little while, but um, it is far too easy to give uh, what they call single signature authority to, to new rating specialists. And the uh, number of cases that are reviewed in a, in a, in a year's time on, on an individual uh, are relatively few, and, and there's lots of opportunities for problems that go unidentified. Our service officers and those of other service organizations are the last quality check that, service, that, that VA has in terms of the quality of a rating. That's why uh, the earlier question about, about can we get problems fixed mm -hmm. uh, is really critical. Because, um, because uh, if that problem goes out the door is un unfixed at that point, then, then usually it is a veteran who is, who is uh, impacted negatively. Uh, it is it's strange, but anecdotally, um, in my experience, most uh, mistakes that, that VA makes, although they tend to be bipartisan, they, they tend to, uh, to go against veterans much more frequently than they do against uh, the uh, thank government. You. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you. And now I recognize the gentlewoman from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I really appreciate you holding this hearing. This is precisely the kind of work I think we should be doing on oversight. And I want to say to General Hickey, um, I'm impressed by you. I have not been impressed, however, by what I see as a West Coast crisis. And that is the delays that are taking place in Seattle, Oakland, and Los Angeles are truly unacceptable. And I want to go over a few things with you. I spent maybe four or five hours at Oakland meeting with um, your directors there. Uh, I then joined with uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, and we had a fix-it session in San Francisco. You've probably heard about it. Over 250 veterans showed up. They were angry, they were hostile, and they had every right to be. I'm just going to tell you a few of these stories. Uh, Sergeant Ari Sorenberg had multiple tours in Iraq. He was facing eviction from his apartment while he waited for over a year for a disability ruling. He was unable to work, a fact that took Oakland VA months and months to try and verify. He needed treatment for PTSD. He was ordered by the VA, actually, to go to the VA Medical Center in Oakland. The breaking point came the day before I took his wife and his mother to meet with the director at Oakland. Until that meeting was set up, the Oakland office was unaware that Mr. Sonenberg was hospitalized in the VA facility where he was expected to remain for several months. At a VA fix-it meeting that um, we had, he told a packed room that he almost committed suicide. Now, the good news is that he will be boarding a plane for home tomorrow. He's had his surgeries. He's had treatment for PTSD. Um, and he has his disability benefits. Had we not intervened, Mr. Sullenberg would be probably dead today. Another gentleman, a 93-year-old World War II vet was, who was confined to a wheelchair, showed up at the Fix-It meeting. He waited for over two years to have his claim adjusted. He had a service connection of 60 percent. He was there in his condition. His caregiver said, it's been two years, and now you're telling us that we've got to go back 
to a doctor to determine what his status is, even though we've already done that. Now, the good news there is because we had that fix-it meeting, within a week he was given retroactive payment of $32,000 and is now receiving $2,000 a month. But he's 92 years old. Michael Cortez argued that his Parkinson's disease was caused by exposure to Agent Orange. He again waited for two years. So it turned out, because we had that fix-it meeting, his claim was recently resolved. He's got a one-time retroactive payment of $92,000 a month and $3,400. Uh, $92,000 was a back retroactive payment, and now he's receiving $3,400 a month. Now, I'm telling you these stories because had we not intervened, they would still be languishing. We have a huge problem on the West Coast. They are not incorporated in the pilot program that you're doing at various VA facilities around, uh, claims facilities around the country. And um, I have a series of questions I want to ask you, and I've got limited time. So what are you going to do to fix it on the West Coast? Secondly, I have um, sent a letter to the director basically saying, if you've got ancient or Agent Orange claims and they're Vietnam vets, they're old. They're in their 70s now, some of them even in their 80s. If they're Agent Orange and there's a presumption and they have the condition that the presumption cites, why aren't we fast-tracking those claims? And then my third question is on MST. As you know, military sexual assault is um, absolutely out of control in the military, 19,000 cases a year. Um, as I understand it, your reviews have found differences in denial rates between sexual assault PTSD and other PTSD cases. I'd like to know what you have found and what you are doing about it. And for those that have been previously denied, what can be done for them in terms of refiling and being reconsidered? Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Speer. Uh, let me start very quickly um, uh, with what we've done in Oakland and where I'm going and that I'm going to repeat this same process in other regional offices that are performing, having challenges in performance. And this is, by the way, the very first time anybody in VA and any VBA undersecretary has ever done this. As you know, we stood down Oakland, other than we kept some production going. We stopped all the inflow into Oakland. I got all your leader and brand new leader in there helping to get this right. I've also moved the area director from Phoenix up to Oakland where he sits uh, in working with the new uh, senior leader there in Oakland. We have took every single one of your employees, our employees, in that regional office and we ran them back through challenge training. The good news is we are done with that in June. They are back to the work and I will tell you what the results of that training were for them for their quality. Uh, they were before um, this environment, their quality was about 69 percent. That quality translates into a production problem because when we find the error, we got to recycle it back as you well described. They are now, after that course, their, uh, their post-training uh, test was at 93 percent. So we will see an impact associated with retraining that entire regional office from head to, head to toe. And I'm going to use that model to go after others who are in that same challenged environment. Second thing we have uh, done is I have established across the nation in every single regional office that I am so glad that Mr. Menard raised quality so that I could tell you I made an investment last fall. There are now quality review teams that are trained to the star national quality levels that are working in every single regional office helping us to fix our errors. And why does that matter? Not just because of what that quality number says. But every time we make a mistake, it costs us 39 days in the process. So if you have extremely low quality, you are likely to have a recycle of those claims quite frequently and a lot of 39-day limitations. Uh, third thing I will say, you asked about old claims, AO fast track. We do have a fast track process for our Agent Orange claims. I'm happy to continue to advertise that we have one. Happy to continue. And by the way, those are not the three presumptives that we have just done under this administration taking care of those three presumptive conditions, that we are all done with those. These are the ongoing. We will have Agent Orange claims forever until the last Vietnam veteran who was ever exposed to that. 
um, uh, is, is not here anymore. We will have those claims. They are not the ones for the three presumptives that took us 37 percent of our workforce and more than 260,000 claims that we did in the last two years. Right decision to make by our Vietnam veterans. That did have an impact in Oakland. It did have an impact in Seattle. It did have an impact in every single regional office across our country. It had an impact to the tune of 260,000 claims in backlog that would not have been in backlog. But I still stand firm for our Vietnam veterans and the daughter of a Vietnam veteran say it was absolutely the right thing to do by those men and women who were never welcomed home the way this administration and this secretary has made that a priority for me to do. Then the last thing we'll do, I am so glad you brought up military sexual trauma, it is the very first issue I grabbed the reins on and ran with when I got on station here, aside from obviously the backlog. And I will tell you, I'm the one that asked for us to go show, uh, show me what our grant denial rate is between MSD, PTSD, and what it is between PTSD for the other three, combat, fear, terrorism. I asked for us to do that. I got it back and I said, this is unacceptable. We had a 25 percent difference in our grant denial rate. I said, we're going to change this process. We did. And by the way, the process is now in a segmented lane, which is one of our new transformation initiatives. We have trained from the VBA person who handles it coming in the door through the exam doctor in the health administration who does the health exam. And we now have everybody trained. I just got the data last Friday that shows I have closed that gap as a result of that effort. We have increased our grants a full 35 percent in our MST as of last Friday because of the direction we did, the actions we took to make those right and do those right and well. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a follow-up question? I know my time is expired. Feel free. Sure. Thank you. But what, are we doing? what are we doing about those that had their claims denied? Are we going back now I, and saying refile? I am glad you asked that quick question as well, Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Speer. Uh, we are sending letters to everyone we have ever denied and saying, we, this is what we do. We have got a new process. If you feel like you were denied an error, please send it to us and we will reaccomplish re re it. Before, You're welcome. Before the gentlewoman uh, yields back, I'd ask unanimous consent actually to include the um, uh, inspection of the VA regional office from Phoenix, Arizona, dated July 17th. One of the concerns, if I understand it, is it took the head of the or one of the leaders in the Phoenix office to put him into Oakland to solve the problem. But when the when the inspector uh, office, the inspector general, went down to the Phoenix office, they found that in one of the summaries. Uh, staff did not cor correctly process 47 percent of the disability claims. Uh, and so I would ask unanimous consent that we include this in the record. I will allow the unanimous consent only if General Hickey gets a chance to make a comment about that. Sure. Thanks. Sure. Th uh, thank you, uh, Congress uh, Congressman Tierney and Chairman Chaffetz. I would appreciate the opportunity. The leader that I put in Phoenix is not the Phoenix Regional Office Director. He is the area director for all of the West environments. So I moved him there to provide better oversight in Oakland. He happens to have his office, his area director office, in the geogra geography called Phoenix, Arizona. Second thing I will tell you is it is important to note in the IG reports, that the I and the IG states it in their report, there is a sentence in there that says, this does not reflect the overall quality of all things done at this regional office. This reflects the bit and piece that we specifically went to look at. And I will tell you, one of the things they have been looking at is something called 100 percent temporary disability. What that means is if you went and had a medical situation, you had a knee surgery, you are given 100 percent temporary disability for a short period of time um, in which we will then come back after that period of time and re-adjudicate your claim based on the healing time associated with that injury. We had a computer problem. We had. Had is the operative word. We had a computer problem uh, that was not capturing the comments that our people were putting in there that would notify them when that period was up. That has been fixed as of June. It is now working. It is not going to uh, create that problem again. But at the per uh, period of time where they were at Phoenix, which was several months ago, that was still an issue. It also notes in that Phoenix report that those people had been fixing those issues as uh, directed by the STAR and compensation services as they were going. Thank you. And I, I would invite you, if there are additional comments in response to the inspector, uh, inspector's report, to, uh, to please include those for the record. 
happy to do so, Chair. Uh, I now recognize myself here as we kind of uh, conclude things. I, listen, I, I appreciate the gravity and the task. I, I can tell in your voice and inflections your, your passion about this issue. I appreciate the fact that you actually show up to these hearings. Uh, we, we had invited uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Gould to show up here, but uh, he was unavailable. Uh, my understanding is when there was an opportunity at the Veterans uh, Affairs Committee, uh, it was unavailable for him to show up, but that you actually showed up. So I, I appreciate you you being here. This is not easy to go through, and the, the task is difficult to say the least. So we're talking about 300,000 employees and $140 billion dollars and, uh, and, and people dealing with very difficult situations. So A, I want to thank you for, for being here and the passion that you, that you bring to this. Our job role and responsibility is to provide some oversight um, and to try to fix the problem because we're oversight, but we're also government reform. And so as we look at this, we want to try to come up with solutions, not just point out some, some, some problems. I'm, I'm sure they're evident uh, to, to you and, and, uh, and to others. Um, so I, I want to give you a, a second here, and, and it's hard to do it justice given the gravity of this. I mean, we, any question deserves you know, a 45-minute answer. If you could just wave your magic wand and do two things, and very briefly, what would, and I'll give you each an, an opportunity to answer this, what would you do? I would implement the plan that we have developed that produces uh, good results and we're seeing the results. Okay. Uh, Mr. Menard. Uh, I'd, I'd uh, if I could wave that magic wand, uh, I'd change the culture on, on, on quality. Uh, as I said earlier, the the, the emphasis is on production and the, and the huge backlog. But, but if 16 percent of the, the cases, decisions are wrong, um, then you are not serving those veterans. Um, and, and let me just interject there. When I talk to somebody uh, uh, who is on the Veterans Affairs uh, uh, Committee, they stated that as well. Uh, they, their concern was customer service. We look at all these metrics and backlogs and other things, but maybe one of the things we ought to be looking at is customer service and how pleased the veterans are with the services that they are provided. Maybe that is the way. Instead of handing out $2.8 million to senior executives, maybe it ought to be the people on the front lines that are going through this. And not just to get their scores higher and give out more, more claims, but how they are treated, how they go through that process. Somebody can come in and independently Maybe that is the metric that needs to change. Maybe that is part of that culture that you talk about in terms of, of quality. But please continue. Sorry to interrupt. Well, the other thing is, is um, uh, this, uh, the, and it is going to come uh, five years down the road, six, eight years, however long it is. Um, but it needs to be today. And, and that is when a, a veteran walks into to a hospital and receives treatment, and they are already service connected for, for the condition for which they are being treated. Uh, the, the results of that examination, that treatment, should, should, as soon as the doctor hits enter, should automatically drop into their, their VBA record. And if it indicates that they are entitled to a higher uh, evaluation, they should be given that. Okay. And in a rules-based decision-making process, um, it, it is certainly possible. Okay. Let me give Mr. Violante a, a, an opportunity here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If it is only two things, the two things would be better training, because DAV National Service officers, if they are with DAV for a year or 30 years, go through continuing training their entire career, uh, and they are tested. Um, I would like to see VA do more of that. And the second thing would be accountability as it relates to uh, quality, because we don't have that now. The the the, the uh, emphasis is on production, not on quality. And if is as I said in my testimony, if we do it right the first time, we'll save a lot of problems and a lot of time. Well, uh, uh, thank you. I, and again, I have a hard time believing that your service was 40 years ago. I don't know how old you are when you started that. I didn't know we were taking people at age six or so, but. Um, I appreciate both of your service. Listen, uh, if I could wave my magic wand, uh, I, I, one, I would totally agree with, with what you said, and I am not nearly as close to it as, as you all uh, here to, today. Um, somehow, some way, there has got to be a better communication between the Department of Defense and veterans. The, the handoff is pathetic. 
and until the secretaries themselves personally, personally take this under their wing, it will not happen. I, our, our military, the American people, we're, we're willing to do and, and can do anything if we have the political will to do it. And I recognize it's different. But the idea that we have all these different standards, that you're not getting the information that you need in, in a format that you can deal with in this day and age is just totally unacceptable. And I, I think the Department of Defense has a lot of questions to also answer in this because the VA is on the receiving end of this and it's not necessarily in the format and the way that we can deal with it. And it has to be a priority. People should be getting stars on their shoulders, uh, not just for going out and winning wars, but also taking care of the men and women that, that, are, that are under our service. So um, again, um, I thank you all for your service, but let me yield to the gentleman from Massachusetts. Well, thank you uh, very much. First of all, thank all three of you for your testimony and your time here today. Um, I think that, you know, that obviously production is an issue and quality is an issue, but I think they are related. I think all of you recognize that and mentioned that you can't really get at the quality issue if everybody is leaning so hard trying to catch up on the production end of it. And I think you have got a plan in place trying to do that. And I think this is, this is absolutely part of it and the accountability comes with that, as does the, the culture and the attitude situation here. I am impressed uh, with the attitude that I hear here from all of you. You know, it seems to be cooperative. It seems to be willing to point out what you think is going wrong without getting nasty and mean about it or blaming people for it, and then work together to try and address it. And uh, generally, you seem to be very interested in, in responding to those things that are pointed out in a positive way, not taking it personally or as a negative, and moving forward to getting it done. Uh, and I think that's exactly what we need to do. Our job is oversight. The chairman is absolutely right. So we don't always come off as as probably being as congratulatory as we ought to be for when things are going right, because we are supposed to try to keep the foot on the pedal and keep people moving in that direction. But I think occasionally we have to acknowledge when things are moving in that direction and just still keep our oversight function on there, looking for uh, ways into doing the reform. This committee should be proud of itself. We were the committee that actually got the ball rolling on sexual assault in the modern era here. And then the Armed Services Committee picked it up from that. But there were a lot of good women in Congress who had bills that weren't getting hearings. And this committee provided the hearings and has been taken up and going in the proper committee for that. Uh, Walter Reed hearings in this committee, I think, started a lot of work, uh, particularly about fixing the facilities and making sure the people that were transitioning from the Department of Defense to VA got more attention. And now you have that issue of trying to iron out that transition period on that. And I think that is all to the better on that basis. So we need to keep working together in this format, our oversight, our reform, but your continued work together. Uh, Madam Secretary, let me just say that if, you know, if I had one thing that I would want to keep constant, it is your involvement in this and your attitude uh, and your, your, really your passion for it. Uh, I am impressed. We may come to some point in the road where we have, you know, we want to take a different view on that or anything like that. But for all three of you, I think you are doing an excellent job in your respective positions and you are working the way professionally and positively the way we need this to happen. I, I thank you for that. And I think the American public and the veterans in particular should be grateful that all of you are working so hard and taking it so seriously. And, and thank you. I thank the gentleman again. Thank you all for your for your service to this country, and and uh, appreciate the hearing today. And uh, this committee now stands adjourned.